I'm Mike Breen, Public Awareness Officer for the American Mathematical Society, and I'm talking with Helen Jenkins and Laura White, who are faculty in the bio, in biostatistics at the Boston University School of Public Health. Uh, they're experts in diseases, and so we're talking to them about modeling or any updates about modeling uh, COVID-19. Uh, Laura, uh, in general, what kind of progress would you say there's been at this point in modeling uh, COVID-19, and are we converging on uh, values for the important parameters when it comes to understanding diseases? Um, I think this is a tough question. I think in general, there is a lot of agreement between most of the major modeling groups on things like reproductive numbers and serial intervals, though there is some wiggle room. And I think occasionally we're still seeing data that, that uh, are causing modelers to scratch their heads a little bit and wonder what might be going on. I think it's hard to um, under underestimate the importance of the heterogeneity of different countries and settings and the impact of interventions and testing practices, which I don't think we have a really good handle on how that's impacting the models and the results we're seeing. I think that's gonna take a while to unpack all of that. But in general, I think reproductive numbers, serial intervals, there seems to be decent consensus on what we're looking at, but still some kind of unusual um, numbers that are popping up occasionally. And, and so is there any kind of, is there any idea about how long someone uh, isn't showing symptoms, but is still contagious? Um, I think that is still not totally clear. The best studies I've seen on that are maybe from the Diamond Princess. Um, Helen might know of studies I'm not aware of, but I think there, I think it's becoming very clear that that is an issue. What extent and for how long is not, um, I haven't seen good studies myself on that. It might be out there, but I haven't seen it. Huh, so the, the cruise ship might give the information. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 Helen, is it, it, uh, Laura was just talking about the data. How would you characterize the data? I, I, I guess it's definitely incomplete, but is it noisy or messy? Or? I, I would say incomplete, noisy, and messy. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that um, one of the main problems is, is that um, the places that are really struggling with the disease at the moment are so overwhelmed that they're really just focusing on how they can provide the best patient care. And the idea that there's anybody to really be collecting good data is kind of beyond the scope of what can be done at this point. Um, I totally agree with Laura about heterogeneity and it's going to be interesting to see data coming from different countries as this hits different countries. I know that just in the past couple of days in the UK, the modelers there have been doing more analysis of um, Italy and Spain and some of the data from there and wondering if the reproductive number is actually slightly higher, just above three, as opposed to something in the region of two, two and a half that we saw from other studies. So things are definitely changing. And of course, as our behaviors change and we do more social distancing, then the reproductive number is gonna start to come right down and come below one. Um, and that'll be really interesting to get those data to really understand what the impact of those behavior changes is. Uh, and, and it also seems that that the information or, or not, I don't know, conclusions might not be the right word, but it seems to change very quickly, the things we know. Uh, yes, I mean, whether it's changing quickly or whether it's that we're just getting a better understanding, I think it's important to distinguish between those two things. Um, I think there are lots of pieces of data that we really wish we had better information on. Um, one of the things that people have been clamoring for for weeks now is um, a better understanding of how many people are actually being infected because we really don't know that at all. Um, we don't know how many people are being asymptomatically or very mildly um, infected. So for example, once we get some data from somewhere on um, serology testing, that's gonna be really informative. And, and so, Laura, would you would you say at this point that the U.S. or and maybe the world uh, is undergoing exponential growth, even though we don't know exactly uh, how many cases there are? So, I think that's a great question. Again, I think heterogeneity is a really important thing to keep in mind here. I think there's um, places that certainly appear to still be very much in exponential growth, and other places where it seems like social distancing and maybe some of the other measures that have been put in place are are taking effect. I just saw. Some data this morning showing you know Miami versus Santa Clara, California, and Santa Clara seems to have flattened out, and they they acted a little bit earlier on some of their social distancing measures. Miami, it's hard to say, but looks like maybe it's starting to come down a little bit, but it's experienced much more rapid exponential growth in cases. Again, with all the caveats of the data and testing practices, and not really knowing how accurate any of that is, um, 
but I think it, it is a mixed bag. I certainly wouldn't say we're coming out of concerns about being an exponential growth anywhere in this in the world. Um, but but I think over the coming weeks, we'll see the impact of the social distancing measures more, hopefully. Uh, and, you know, we hear exponential growth a lot in the news, and we also hear the phrase flattening the curve. Uh, uh, Helen, does that mean actually, you know, smashing it down so it's not the, the exponential or a big bell curve? Or uh, does that mean really just shifting yeah. the, time, the number of cases? Well, ideally, what you want to be doing is taking that big peak and just flattening it out. Um, we've all seen these horrible graphs where you see the um, capacity of the healthcare system and how the peak goes way above that. So the idea is to just spread everything out over time so that we can cope with um, the number of severely diseased people coming into different hospitals and we're able to help all of those people. So the idea is definitely not to shift the peak, but to flatten it out and smooth it out over time. Uh, and again, it's probably way too soon. I mean, social distancing seems to be a good idea. Uh, but it, it, and in some places, it, it does seem to be working. Uh, would you say, uh, Laura, would you say that's a, the best thing for people or that can be done right now? Or? I think at, at this point, it's really the only thing we have that we can do right now. It, it feels um, like this is, this is really all we know how to do. We don't have pharmaceutical interventions. Um, we don't really have any other ways. And it's interesting, there are you know, I was just reading this morning, the Netherlands is experimenting, I think, with slightly less, I'd say, draconian social distancing measures. And that's a unique country where it's a little smaller and maybe they can kind of target a little bit more. Time will tell how that works out. Um, but I think at this point, yeah, social distancing is really the only thing, the only tool we have in our pocket, really. And I think the way that is implemented, the timing of that, the environment in which it's implemented, it'll be interesting to see how effective it is. Again, these heterogeneities, as we'll keep saying, are really important. And the context in which those are implemented are, are probably going to have dramatic impact on how effective they are. Um, hopefully, when, if ever we have another pandemic, which I think it's safe to say these things, we, in the modeling community, infectious disease community, expect these things, this is probably not going to be the only time we see something like this. Um, we'll learn a lot from this and understand better maybe how we can use social distancing even more effectively in the future. So will we have these things just because uh, people associate so much with one another or they, you know, they get around so much? Uh, it's a good question. I think it probably depends on who you ask, but um, you know, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but I, you know, I think there are pathogens that are out there in animal populations that make the jump to human populations as it appears that this coronavirus has. Um, and we're a very inter interconnected bunch of people in this world now and, and things are going to spread they mutate and evolve so I think it's to be expected that this is not not the last time we'll see something like this certainly these things have been happening just maybe not on the scale Ebola we see continuing to pop up Zika um, you know we always anticipate when's the next pandemic strain of influenza going to hit how bad will it be so I these are not surprising events they're unfortunate events and I think this particular one it certainly is much bigger magnitude and impact than maybe some of the ones we've had in the last, last hundred years, for sure. Uh, so, so Helen uh, or Laura, is there anything you'd like to add or anything you'd really like people to know? So one thing I was going to add to what Laura said, she, I mean, she's obviously absolutely right that social distancing is the only tool we have at this point. But I think in addition, I would say, during this period of social distancing, it's important to use this time effectively. And one way that we can do that is to be really ramping up testing capacity and contact tracing capacity, um, because this is unlikely to just go away in the next couple of months. We're not just gonna all come out of our homes and everything will be fixed. Um, and so it's important to use this time so that when there are flare ups or you know, a potential second wave later in the year, we're able to deal with it in a way um, which is maybe more akin to what they've done in South Korea, for example, or Singapore, they haven't quite had to use such draconian social distancing measures, which obviously have impacts on the economy and on people's mental health and things like this. So it's important that we kind of gather together and mobilize those other tools that we could have at our disposal. Uh, and so if you had a magic wand, is there one tool you'd really like to have? We'd like to have like many more tests or uh, many more hospitals or 
Well, ideally, we'd magically have a vaccine, but <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's not necessarily going to happen. And if it does, it won't be for a while. Um, yes, I think um, definitely mobilizing um, widespread testing with very rapid results would be a great thing to be able to do. In addition, if we had antibody testing, um, as I mentioned earlier, not only would we have a good sense of how many people have been infected, but we might have a better sense of what immunity is like and who is, you know, maybe feels kind of safe, let's say, to be out in the workforce and doing things and getting the country moving again. Uh, all right, Laurie, is there anything you would want to say at the end here? No, I think those are all really good points. I think we're just in a very messy situation right now. Um, I was just on the phone with one of my clinician colleagues who just got off service and, you know, it's just hospitals are scrambling to re respond to this situation with shortages of gear and figuring out their protocols and how to channel patients appropriately, dealing with patients coming in who they didn't expect to have COVID and find out that they do. Um, so this is, it's just a very challenging time. I think hospitals really are just being swarmed with issue after issue. And I think as researchers, we wish we had nice data to address this, but I think as Helen mentioned earlier, um, we're not in this position yet of being able to design really nice studies. We're just trying to respond to a crisis right now. Um, and hopefully in the process, learn as much as we can that will benefit research going forward. All right. Well, uh, thank you both very much. That's nice of you to take the time to talk about this and let, and let us know uh, what, what you know. Uh, that's uh, Helen Jenkins and Laura White, and they're uh, faculty at the Boston University's uh, in Biostatistics at Boston University School of Public Health. Thanks.